Let's pray together again today. Heavenly Father, we just love you. We need you today. You are the, the blessed and the holy one, the one through whom all good things come. You are the father of lights, the father of, of everything that is good and pleasing and perfect. And I pray, Lord, that we would be content to be those that are doing your will. Teach us how to walk according to your way, O oh Lord. Teach us how to be your good servants. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Man, well, we are going to be in Nehemiah chapter 8 today. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. And in Sunday school this morning, we heard about uh, a really long sermon by Paul. And here we have uh, one that's like half the length. Paul's was 12 hours. Ezra's in our reading today is only six. And we're just going to go half that today. That seems like a good... <laughs> I brought snacks anyway. So... The, the big point today is we want to talk about going small for big results. And we're going into this passage out of Nehemiah because we're focusing still on our read, pray, and serve in obedience to Christ's discipleship strategy. And one huge part of our strategy is the development and the organization of small groups that we'll rehash and talk about and go deeper into some of the things that we talk about and do here in church. And Nehemiah organizes an event just like this, along with the priest Ezra. They all come together, and they hear the word, and then they go small, and they have people throughout helping explain what the, what the law is saying, what they're hearing. And then they rejoice because they understand and they seek to apply it to their lives. And that really is the model of our Christian walk, is we come together as the big church and we rejoice. We sing praise together. We hear God's word together. And then we try to understand what we have heard. And then we try to apply what we have understood. So nothing too phenomenal or groundbreaking in terms of a, a teaching here but as we often talk about it's not a matter of it being a difficult concept it's a matter of being difficult to do it so nehemiah chapter 8 verses 1 through 12 should be in your bibles and it'll be up on the screen there it says this all the people gathered together at the square in front of the water gate they asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given Israel. On the first day of the seventh month, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding. While he was facing the square in front of the water gate, he read out of it from daybreak until noon before the men, the women, and those who could understand. All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a high wooden platform made for this purpose. Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hiklia, and Maaseah stood beside him on his right. And to his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem, Hashbaniah, <laughs> Hashbanana? No. <laughs> Banana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book in full view of all the people since he was elevated above everyone. As he opened it, all the people stood up. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and with their hands uplifted, all the people said, Amen, Amen. Then they knelt low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Jeshua, Vani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shebathiah, Hodiah, Maaseah, Kelida, Azariah, Joseph, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, who were Levites, explained the law to the people as they stood in their places. They read out of the book of the law 
translating and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was read. Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to all of them, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared, since today is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, since today is holy. Don't grieve. Then all the people began to eat and drink, send portions, and have a great celebration, because they had understood the words that were explained to them. Has anybody here ever gone home from church and said, I understood what the pastor was talking about. Let's have a feast. We're going to celebrate today I got church. I just think it's a wonderful vision, a wonderful explanation of how it is good to respond to God's word, to say, we understood it, we seek to apply it. Nehemiah was an accomplished delegator. He delegated out the building of the wall so that in God's power it was accomplished in record time. He delegated food distribution, and he divided out the governance of the people. Moses was taught the importance of breaking down a task so that people could support the work at various levels of responsibility. I don't know if you remember, but he was trying to do it all himself, and his father-in-law came and said, you're doing it wrong, Moses. And so they broke it down so that peoples of tens, fifties, hundreds, five hundreds, thousands, all had leaders. He delegated out the work. The apostles understood they needed to delegate the work because there was a problem with how the people were being taken care of, so they developed the role of deacon so that they could serve the tables and the apostles could do their work. They delegated. Paul understood the unified body of Christ to be given diverse gifts so that all sorts of ministry and roles could be fulfilled and needs could be met. He cast the delegation net so wide as to suppose that in the church everybody had a function to fulfill. There was no sideliners. Jesus sent out the 70. He couldn't go everywhere. While he was a human, while he was in his human body, He couldn't be everywhere all the time. And so to help spread the word and to train the people, he sent out missionaries. He taught them what to do. He sent them out. He celebrated with them when they came back. Because ultimately, the entire work would be trusted to guys like that. And to guys like us. It's been delegated on and on and on. And so we should shy away from and reject the idea that any one person or any one group of people is entirely responsible for fulfilling all that Jesus commanded in the Great Commission. But there are times for the church to get together. So step one in the process is go big. And here the word is one. In Hebrews, it is said that we are not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. Maybe you've heard someone say, or maybe you've said it yourself, I don't need to go to church because I can worship God by myself just fine at the lake, camping in the woods, wherever you might be. It's in violation of God's command to think like that, at least in the long term. We are told, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together. There is no such thing as lone wolf Christianity. You can't be a Christian by yourself. We think of the hundred little sheepies that Jesus told the story about. And the one that went off, maybe he was thinking, I can be a sheep all by myself. I can be a flock all alone. And that shepherd said, no. He left the 99 ones to fend for themselves for a moment, and he got that sheep, and he brought him back because we are meant to be together. We are meant to be united. 
Why is the large group gathering of the church such an important event? Well, we are to encourage each other as we realize that there are others who stand with us. The prophet Elijah, he had a really interesting life, and God used him in some powerful ways. But after his great victory on Mount Carmel, and he has his people that chose to stand with him after the miracle, slaughter all the prophets of Baal, and he goes down and he gets a threat from Jezebel, the queen. And he just wilts. He says, I've got nothing left. I'm so tired. I wish I could just die. But God sustains him and he gets to, gets to the mountain. And he tells God as God interacts with him, he says, God, I'm the only one left. There's nobody left but me. And God says, that's not true. There's, I've saved 7,000 who haven't bent the knee to Baal. Now, in all of the country of Israel, that's like you have all of Israel, maybe as South Dakota, and that would mean like Sturgis stayed faithful in all of South Dakota. Not a hugely encouraging number, but it's not nobody. It's not nothing. And so he was encouraged to be reminded that there are still those who stand with him. Our Sunday school lesson today reminded us of Paul, who traveling to Rome had to be feeling lonely, but he got greeted by a bundle of believers as he got off the boat, and he was deeply encouraged, and he thanked God because even way out here where he had never been, three years earlier he had written the letter to Romans and sent it here, and it must have done some good because there were some Christians who greeted him and said, we are here with you. Who else will lift up our arms? Who else understands what it means to die to yourself, to live for Christ? And then corporate praise and worship is what God requires. We're told that where two or more are gathered, there I am with you. And man, isn't it great where we could have more than two together here today? We have the opportunity to observe the ordinances together. Nowhere else. Can we see baptism instructed, celebrating communion together? Well, we're here together to do those things, to hear the word of God proclaimed together. In our narrative today, the people needed to be gathered together because they needed to be reoriented towards God. They had been scattered all over. Their faith had not been practiced for over 70 years and now they were coming together, trying to get right, but they didn't know what to do. They didn't understand what was right. And perhaps this is the best thing that the large group gathering does. It points us in the right direction, gives us the opportunity to seek to apply to our lives the truths that are revealed, and gives us the opportunity to share our lives with others. It is the one thing that we need to be doing is getting together here and hearing how can I point myself towards God. But we'll be honest, I think you guys know this is true, one hour a week of being in God's presence is not sufficient. It's insufficient. You just try eating like a bowl of cereal a week. See how your life goes, right? Eat one meal a week and, and see. Say, say one sentence to your wife, husbands, a week, and how's your relationship fare? For a little while, you can sustain. For a little while, we can go on. But we've said it before, and it's so true. Our faith is like going up the down escalator. If you stop or slack, we go backwards. There is no opportunity to plateau. Rick Warren in his book, A Purpose Driven Church, considers the church as this organism that's either growing or dying. Because we're the living body of Christ. And you guys know as living beings, there's really no such thing as plateaued. You're either gaining or losing. And it takes work even just to maintain where we're at. So, we go small, and we seek to pursue understanding. All of these 
hard to pronounce names that Nehemiah lists, there are people that were helping him explain and helping the people understand what was being delivered to them because they had no idea. They didn't understand. I think about teaching, Jesus teaching the parable of the sower of the seeds to the large group. You guys know the parable. They talk about the farmer. He's throwing seeds on the path in the pasture, and it lands on all these four different kinds of surfaces. And when he is done finishing the parable, everybody just kind of looks at him. Mmm, seeds, yes. So the disciples pull him aside and say, Jesus, we don't understand. Will you help us, please? We don't get what you're saying. And so to the small group, Jesus explains. And he says, you know, I teach in parables so that people don't understand right away. I teach like I do so that people have to pursue understanding. God wants you to desire him. Their hearts are darkened. They don't have the ability to understand. And Jesus' command was to ask, seek, and knock. Pursue, ask questions, seek the Lord, knock on his door, desire to be full of understanding of what he commands. As Ezra read the law out loud, he had people helping to explain the text throughout the day because knowledge without understanding is worthless. I don't know if anybody here has ever been through some math classes in school. Maybe you've memorized like the Pythagorean theorem on how to find the hypotenuse of a triangle. Maybe you memorized, maybe you memorized the formula, but you're like, I don't understand. I don't get it. Maybe you've looked at the schematic of some kind of electronic device and you said, I understand that I'm looking at blueprints, but I have no idea what this is. Maybe you're like the disciples and maybe you're like me where you read a passage of scripture and say, I understand that this is written in a language I'm supposed to get. I have no idea what this says. We can be full of knowledge, but if we don't know what to do with that, it's just pointless. There's no, there's no reason for it. And so when we talk about going small for big results, a small group, a mentorship program, being discipled, takes what we talk about here and moves it into a situation where you can ask questions, where you can say, whoa, whoa, back up. What was that thing that Paul said to Timothy that women will be saved through childbearing? Because I need to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, you go ask someone after church about that. Delon knows the answer. <laughs> ask her. We need to be in situations where we can get our questions answered, where we can talk about it, when we can pursue understanding because God's promise was that if you want to know, I will let you know. James says, if you lack understanding, pray. I'll give you understanding, God says. And not just a little bit. He says, I want to give it to you abundantly. I want to give you a lot of wisdom, a lot of understanding, because God wants us to be doing his work and his will. It would be a really foolish parent who says, I want you to do exactly what I want, but I'm never going to tell you what I want or how to do it. Good luck. God is not like that. He's not foolish. He's not evil. He's not cruel. Therefore, if we have a hard time applying the knowledge that he gives us, his revealed word here, we should seek him and how to apply it. We should seek situations where we can gain that kind of understanding. So when we develop these small groups and launch them out, it would be great for every person to desire to be a part because that's where it happens. It happens at Sunday school. You can ask questions. You can say, I don't get that. Understanding is good. 
But what happened to these Israelites? Understanding can lead to conviction when our lives don't match up with what God's will is. They were weeping. Why were they weeping? They were hearing the prophets. They were hearing the law. They understood that everything that they had been doing, everything that led up to the exile, they had brought on themselves, even though God had over and over told them what they needed to be doing, they ignored it. And they were sorry. They were full of repentance. Has that ever happened to you, reading God's word, reading his commands in the New Testament to us, and you say, my life is not matching up to this. I am not doing what the Lord requires of me. When that happens, you have two choices. You can just kind of close the book and say, that's enough of that, and carry on your way. You can turn the page and just keep reading, pretending like you didn't see it. Or you can repent and turn our lives rightly to be in compliance with God. Becoming involved in a small group is critical because it's the best venue to be encouraged like that, to even be corrected if our lives aren't pointing in the right direction. But look, knowing is step one. Understanding is step two. Step three is applying. Go out and apply what you have learned. Then all the people began to eat and drink and send portions and have a great celebration because they had, underst they had understood the words that were explained to them. Now they needed to do it, apply it to their lives. We're told in Scripture that to know what is right and yet not do it is a sin. If you know what you're supposed to do and have an understanding of how it is to be accomplished, and yet you don't do it, you are sinning against God. So be careful what you learn. I don't know if at the end of it we can claim ignorance, like, so because I was scared of that promise, God, I resolved to know nothing about you. So I could be held accountable for, for nothing. I don't think it's going to work like that. Just as knowledge without understanding is worthless, so too is understanding without application. In fact, this is probably... This is probably worse. If you want to hear a frightening promise, we can go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Why don't you turn there with me? I want to read this with you. 2 Peter chapter 2, the end of the chapter, starting in verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if having escaped the world's impurity through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in these things and defeated, the last state is worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after having known it, to turn back from the holy command delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a washed sow returns to wallow in the mud. That's nice. What is Peter saying here? You have an obligation. You have an obligation to continue to pursue God. If he has seen fit to reveal to you and to start in your heart that seed of faith that is grown up and drawn out, through continuing to pursue him, that continuing desire for obedience. If we know that and we begin to pursue it in understanding, there are some serious consequences about turning our back on God. You can find some more in, in Hebrews chapter 6 and in chapter 10. Frightening verses about turning away from what you understand to be the good and right will of God. Christians, I think we all understand more than we let on. We understand what the Lord requires of us, and we do it, we understand, because God says he's written it on our hearts. It's not a, a profound mystery. 
But we want to be more like the guy that Jesus talked to when he asked him. He said, what's the best command? He says, well, it's love the Lord your God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. And the guy's like, yeah, okay, I got that, but, but who's my neighbor? It's like when a former president of ours said, well, that depends how you define is. Right? How, how do we define is? All right, let's not play games with God. We understand and we know and so what we ought to do is, is do it when it comes to matters of, of forgiveness. Sometimes we don't want to. When it comes to loving an enemy, we say, yeah, but not this one. When it comes to charity and giving of our time and our possessions, we say, well, I don't have that much to give. And we forget about that widow who put in her two pennies, which was her last bit of money. She had it all. And how Jesus praised that and said, look. That's real faith right there. I want to encourage us, church, to be the kind of church that pursues God, that pursues knowing Him, understanding Him, and then going out and doing it. We can't stop at step two. It's just no good. We have to make it all the way. And so I just want to encourage you, as we develop these ministries that you take, the opportunity. If you don't have somebody who is involved in your life as a mentor, as someone doing discipleship, get involved with somebody. There's people in this church that would be willing to do that. If you're the person who is full of, of the wisdom and knowledge of the Lord and you don't have someone you're pouring that into, I encourage you to find somebody to, to pour into because there is growing up among us in our very neighborhoods, people who have no idea the name of Jesus. There's people around us who don't know what buildings like this are for. What do you do in that place, they wonder. How can it be that we have a generation? I've often wondered, how could it be that after Joshua and the elders all passed away, there rose up a generation who didn't know Christ? And now we know the answer. It's actually pretty easy for that to happen. And so I want to encourage you, church, to not be the kind of people that will let that happen around us or on our watch. Because if we go out and apply what we know, then the people around us, without a doubt, will know, at the very least, the name of Jesus and have that opportunity to choose. So let's carry on choosing for God, seeking to understand him, living our life in accordance with his will. Amen.